All right. Um, do I have your permission to record you? Yes. Okay. All right. To do this interview? All right. Okay. Well, it's an honor to have this interview because I think that a lot of young individuals, um, old and all individuals, um, would look at your your um your your what you've accomplished as extremely unusual um it's uh it's not every day that you run into um an asian person chinese who has uh authorship uh, who's done freelance after freelance to maintain everything that you do um and now you have uh could i say that you have an independent off the grid life I, yeah, I would say so. That's right. a pretty good description of it. <laughs> yeah, right. You're off the grid. Um, you've, you've made it to the other side, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say quite made it, but we're, we're getting there. <laughs> right. You're definitely not on the, the normal side of things, right? So the other <laughs> side, right? The other side, the, the non-traditional side. So, um, so, you know, I, I look at your, um, your history and if we go back to like 2018, you were an English teacher at the Kumon Math Center, right? And you still, yes. could be, right? You still could be, Sorry? but um, you still could be, uh, you could always go back, right? But now it's optional, right? Okay. Yes. <laughs> English is a second language. I mean, but you know, if you, if you go into the details, which only can be accomplished um, by having this interview. So I'm going to start off by asking you, um, uh, you know, where, 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 uh, where were you born? So I was born in Changle, Fuzhou, Fujian. Hmm. Yeah. And how did you end up in Canada? Well, it wasn't really my choice because my parents brought me out here when I was four years old. So they immigrated to Canada first with my dad and he worked here a few years before he can bring my mom out. Hmm. And then once my mom came out, after a year or two, she brought me out. Wow. And um, why did you go to Canada? Or why did they think they needed to go to Canada? It's funny because actually my dad wanted to go to Japan originally, but it was too hard to immigrate there. And that's why his second choice was Canada. Wow. All right. And what does your dad do? As his, uh, What was his skill in China? And what, what, is, his, uh, what is his skill uh, in Canada? Uh, so both my parents were teachers in China. My dad was a physics and physical education teacher. And then my mom was an art teacher. But of course, that doesn't translate over to Canada. You would have to go back to schooling. And it's very difficult later in life. At least for them, they found English very hard to learn. But he is a restaurant owner now here. And my mom teaches art at home. So from physics and physical education... <laughs> to a restaurant owner now yeah. what in what capacity does he does he actually does he do other things in the restaurant or did he have to uh so he began working as kind of like a dishwasher cleaner before he moved on to being a chef now he is the owner okay wow so he had he wore many hats hats that he's never yeah. worn before never had to wear before it's not even mm -hmm. in his skill set i mean physics and and, and cooking food Right. And then own the <laughs> restaurant. You know, that that's uh that's that's really um flexible, it's called, right? The flexibility. I suppose right? you could say that. Yeah. It's, it's more than 180 degrees. It's maybe 360 in in uh in a three-dimensional kind of way, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But it's funny because I always think about it, and probably in his mind, it's kind of like it is a job. As long as he can put food on the table, it is almost wow. all the same to him. I got to rub my eyes because when I think about this, putting food on the table, that's like Maslow's like basic thing, right? Do you have any siblings? I do. I have a younger sister. So back then they still had the one child policy. So my sister was not born until we came to Canada and they were actually allowed to have like another child. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Well, they, they stepped into the zone where there was no regulations for this. Um, mm -hmm. and they, they chose to take advantage of that. Now, speaking of, so we know something about the flexibility, although that might not apply to you. How much Chinese did you know it for? 
Like, I would say a kindergarten level at maybe like elementary school, lower elementary school speaking, but not so much in writing and reading. Because when I came here, I had just started uh, first grade, but I don't remember much about it. I remember much more about elementary school, but back then they didn't teach as much. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, just so people know, like why I have a mask on, it's uh, February 2nd, 2024. I have a mask on because I was just receiving stuff from the door. That's why I was five minutes late, right? Right, I Right, I yeah, yeah. and uh, and you were sick recently, right? That's why we couldn't yeah. do our recording um, our interview in uh, in January. But um, but there's something going on out there. There's uh, viruses mm -hmm. of all kinds. There's still COVID, but there's also RSV and uh, and a bunch of influenza. So just viruses alone, it's bad. So so yeah, um, that that's that's why this is there. Otherwise, you know, he might come back. So I I need to have this yeah. on. All right. So, so they, you know, you, you didn't have very much, I have two daughters. So, so at four years old, they're not going to remember most things. Um, so you, do you know Chinese? I do. So growing up, my parents basically forced me, well, my dad really forced me to speak Chinese at home with him. And he would not respond to me if I spoke in anything other than Chinese, but I was also ESL until the third grade, so around eight years old. So I wasn't very good at English and I mostly only spoke Chinese. But there is this kind of running joke um, that my friends always say, where they say Fujianese people are not very good at like regular Mandarin because it's very infused with Fuzhou dialect, which mm -hmm. is kind of true because we mix all our L's and R's together and N's and L's, but. <laughs> wow. So your father had, you know, his choices to influence you mattered because without doing that, um, Canada, and what part of Canada did you guys settle in uh, when you first arrived? So we were in Chinatown, downtown Toronto, before we moved to Scarborough. Right. I've been there. Very different. Like downtown mm -hmm. Chinatown is not the same as, uh, as Scarborough. <laughs> no. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Very just different. Get, right. Just to get out of Chinatown or back into China from Scarborough, you could be stuck in traffic for some serious amount of time. Right? Yeah. 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 That's how you know I've been there. I'm I'm not not Canadian, but I had my time in Toronto, um, amongst other provinces. Alberta, you know, is another province I've been to, and yeah. uh, and um, and I've been to other outskirts of Toronto, like uh, you know Kingston on one side, mm -hmm. Kitchener on another. Um, I've been to Montreal, but I've also lived in Laval. So oh yeah yeah yeah. So I I know Canada, um, and it's it's um it, you could say it's a it's a it's a um, it's a difficult place for someone to just uh, flex. And your dad definitely had flexibility. Um, and to own a restaurant, where was his restaurant in downtown Chinatown? No. So he, this was when I was in like fourth grade. So we were in Scarborough already. And he oh. opened a restaurant in Whitby, hmm. which Whit was quite, yeah, quite far in kind of in the middle of nowhere. But he had good business there. So it makes whatever sense. Whatever works. <laughs> Because you know how many Chinese restaurants there are in Toronto. I mean, the the comp competition. Yeah. Is like, unless some of unless his skills were like out of this world, right? Maybe they are. Mm -hmm. Are they out of this world? His skill sets. Um, it was a sushi restaurant, and I can't eat sushi. Ah, that's really really amazing. Um, so are you like um allergic to fish? Are you um or all animals? Or how how what do you mean by you can't eat sushi? I think it might have something to do with like the raw food and not agreeing with me and also the vinegar in the sushi rice, the acidity just like does not. Yeah. Hmm. It's not good for your teeth actually, but you know, that's a different topic. So you, he didn't form a restaurant so you could have food. He formed a restaurant so that you could, you could, you could, you could support the family um, and he mm -hmm. could grow the business. So he's very intelligent. I mean, you know, because to learn the skill set from physics and physical ed to be able to then open a restaurant 
and to go head to head with others who have restaurants. I, I've seen how many restaurants there are in Toronto, Chinatown, and Scarborough. I mean, the competition is fierce. Yes. Yeah. So it would be makes I, sense. Yeah. yeah. I think that's why now he owns a restaurant in Quebec in like a small village. Yeah, there. I've also eaten at those. I maybe never. I don't know if I've ever eaten at the one in Whitby, but I've eaten the ones like where you know you go to Waterloo and they have the where the students eat and the and you know mm -hmm. there isn't. Once you leave the center, and we'll call the center Chinatown and Scarborough, Markham, that area. Once you leave that area, it all like tapers pretty quickly. So. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I now know of one more place I can go to now, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> if I wanted sushi, but um, but I, you know, for Chinese food, um, it, it tapers quickly. So, so even yes. does he also do Chinese food, or is it strictly sushi? It's kind of like an all-you-can-eat restaurant. So oh. there are like kitchen food type things, mm. mostly Japanese, but some of them look Chinese leaning. Mm. He created the fusion. Which is very smart. You cannot <laughs> compare him to anybody else, right? Yeah. I, I suppose so. But I would say because I've worked in his restaurant mm. uh, when I was younger, and most of his restaurants were like Western people. They were mm. not like Asian people. That's even more impressive. You've now changed the the audience so that you're <sighs> not even in the same realm, right? You've kind of done the same thing. In your, in your life right <laughs> but you've done it even to a whole nother level so so now you know as an uh you know the, the next question i had in sequence was if you could live anywhere in the world uh would it be where you are that is a good question but i also feel like i haven't traveled nearly enough to answer this question I feel like if I could, I would love the opportunity to live everywhere for a little while kind of throughout my life so mm. I can learn about like firsthand the cultures there and their people and the, how they live and how it compares to like how it is in Canada. And like one of my dreams is always to learn a lot of different languages, but I always have a difficulty of like learning different languages. But it would be cool, I think, to communicate with others in their native tongue. There's just something about it that's very different than if you just kind of communicate in a shared second language. Mm -hmm. And and how old are you now? Uh, I am turning 27 this year. Okay, so you have plenty of time to be exploring <laughs> the world. Um, although, you know, time is a very interesting thing, is that you may say you have a lot of time and then uh, all and then from a different perspective you won't be in your 20s within 3 years right so mm -hmm. right and then and then your perspective will change uh, not exactly when you hit 30 but your perspective changes with age so mm -hmm. you can't go back and say oh how do you think you would feel about living you know xyz place um at 21 because you weren't 21 when you were there or at 15 when you're there. So, so yeah, um, uh, the next question is, um, so you, you can't quite answer what it is, but right now, do you enjoy um, uh, in, you know, where you are uh, as an author? It is, I think, experience-wise, very rewarding. Mm -hmm. I feel like it has helped me kind of broaden my understanding of humanity and the world as a whole, though I wouldn't claim that I'm any like parts knowledgeable about it. Um, mm. But I think writing has kind of allowed me to come in contact with like people I wouldn't otherwise come in contact with and read stories from their experiences and perspectives and kind of dive into that in my own writing, kind of compli further complicate it and to rethink what I know or what I think I know. Um, but I feel like financially it has been very taxing and very unmotivating because of how little it pays, especially when you start uh, in the short fiction field. And it's not like writers of the past who live in the 70s and the 60s. And they always say, oh, I used to write one short story a month and I'd be able to pay rent. You wouldn't be able to say that now, especially with acceptance rates 
being like one to three percent in magazines and many of them being like token or semi-pro payments um if you're lucky you might get a few hundred but you would have to be very very lucky hmm. yeah the um the amount of uh of the the, the system changed but yeah. yeah right the the requirements changed and now you, you you know you you're you are producing something that stimulates um the the eye or the ears or the hearts of the beholder the soul of someone and they reach out uh and you know who reads your work it's people who um who love what you do but also uh some of them are ones who may want to make a profit off of you so when you look at it that way which is another way of looking at it um it gets you out of Canada in a spiritual kind of way. It's almost like your work is traversing to other locations. Are you frozen? I think you're frozen. Um, I need to see when you come back in because you're not moving. Let's see what do we do. Yeah, you're you're definitely dropped off. It's just me now. So Ai Jiang is a very interesting author um, because of where she's born. Let me message her to see where she is. Um, you know, and what she's done with her life is really intriguing. Uh, let me ask her, are you reconnecting? Um, your link. All right. Well, we'll see if she signs back in. Now, as someone who has two daughters, I oftentimes think about this quite a bit um, so that I don't over-influence. At the same time, I influence my, my little girls. My next question to her would be, how is life as a writer, both experientially and financially? So I would like her to come back in what I might need to do is uh, is cut the recording short, and then have her have her join back in when um, because this could be a while. There's no response on her end. Oh, there it is. Okay. Let's see. All right. How how are you? You're back. Good. Okay. Yes, our right. internet got cut off. I'm not oh. sure why, but we are on data now, so it is yeah. Fine. Oh, the the why is usually when you're doing something really juicy. That's when <laughs> something happens, right? You know. Yes. Yeah. It, it since you helped your dad at the restaurant, um, you know, you know that just when the conversation is like. Can I take your order? <laughs> you know, you get to know someone. So yeah. Um, my next question was, how is life? And we kind of was was reaching into that. Um, mm -hmm. How is life as a writer, both experientially and financially? And you touched upon financially. You have to produce quite a bit. Um, mm -hmm. to, um, but do you do you need to um, make a living? Yes. Oh, you do? So oh. right now. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, well, that is that is a plan. So originally I worked as a teacher, but I also work uh, as a ghostwriter. Mm -hmm. And that paid a decent amount, something like um, per term, it would be 20,000. So every year, maybe like 50,000 or so. So it was a good um, contributor to family income. So right now my spouse is like the primary um income maker and i am mm. hoping eventually i'll be able to add on to that more with uh my writing career but as you probably know a lot of people do not make a lot on writing and it highly depends on your book sales basically uh the advances you get um and things like that so in 2022 i think from short stories alone it was about six thousand dollars for the year which is 
not very much if you compare it to like normal jobs or even part-time jobs, but compared to a lot of writers who are trying to break in, it is a decent bit amount of money. Um, mm. And then last year it doubled to about 12,000. So I was like, okay, it is, it is picking up. <laughs> so I'm hoping this year it will, you know, follow the trajectory. And they always say for writers, um, the more backlog you have, the more steadier income you will have. But that takes a long time to build. So mm. being a writer is not very short term friendly, but it is more long term rewards. Mm. Um, so experientially, um, what would you say is this? Would If you had to do it over again, would you choose being a writer? I think I would. I feel like I am the type of person who loves to learn things, but there are not a lot of things that I am willing to stick with. And writing is one of those things that I enjoy and I would stick with. Um, I'm very bad at forcing myself to do things that I don't like to do because then they end up being very short term. Mm. So some people think that that's like a tension deficit or something, but it can also be by choice right? I, I have your same problem. I'm an inventor. So, um, so, you know, you don't get a lot of people saying, Hey, you know, we need an inventor here. And how do you break in? Um, and then if you, if someone gives you an advance, now you are, you are, you, you have liability, like you have to invent for them. So, right. It's like, if someone gives you a contract to write you, um, uh, in advance, you have to write for them. It's not like, Oh, you know, I don't feel like it anymore. Mm -hmm. You took the advance. So, so I oftentimes tell myself financially, or when I was younger, um, I'm 50 this year. So when I was younger, I would tell myself, first of all, I'm, I'm, I'm already a millionaire, which I'm not right. When I was younger, I, you know, I would tell myself I'm a millionaire mm -hmm. so that I could pretend to convince myself to keep going. Right. That way there is no comparison because if you compare it being an inventor to anything else in the world, it doesn't make any sense. First of all, as an inventor, you have to invent things that don't exist. Otherwise, you're not a very good inventor. You just like right, take things that already exist. Well, the other part of non-existent things, a lot so the, your competitor that says non-existent things or people around you socially that say non-existent things are people who are crazy. Um, people have mental disorders, right? So you're kind of like in the, in the, in the same realm. Right. And and then mm -hmm. to prove constantly that what you have is patentable or possible, um, it's your denominator is how many tries did you make? So so, for example, I have 41 patents. If I if I tried 41 times, that's one thing. It's one for one. But if I tried 41 million times, that's not a very good percentage. And uh, mm -hmm. imagine trying and then thinking and then feeling, so you have to do with other things as an inventor um, to supplement, because you know what you just said, you're a millionaire, you're not, right? But you gotta do things that that kind of fill. So tutoring is one of the things I did when, even when I was in high school. Um, and I taught people a different way to think of how to solve a physics problem, um, a chemistry problem or a scientific problem, so that you're not just plugging and chugging or doing a brain dump on a test exam. And then as the test build up, then you've checked all your boxes, but you really don't remember much because your summers were on doing something else. So you got to find that connection for whatever you're doing, whether it's in medicine or other things. Can you invent yourself out of something? So I open mm -hmm. doors and holes and I'm able to fold certain opportunities and time. You learn your skills like you, you've found that you would know you would like there's there's not too many things that can get you out of Canada without actually physically leaving Canada. You can. As a writer, you're actually reaching people all over the mm -hmm. world. And so that's very impressive. So you should stick with that. Um I'm gonna ask you some background information about uh, I gave you the Chinese words. Were you able to, did you have to look that up or did you know what those Chinese words meant? I just based on the, English? well, if you read it out loud, yeah. But if you read it out loud to me, I would know what they mean. On page, like the words themselves, I wouldn't know what they mean. Okay. All right. Um, 
the Cantonese, I, I speak Cantonese, um, is uh, it sounds for kutsum. Kutsum is determination. Like you have to like be determined to make mm -hmm. a decision, right? You, if you don't have kutsum, you don't, you can't choose your left or right. You can't choose if do should we go north or should we go south? I don't know. I'm undetermined, right? So so kutsum it means uh, determination. It's needed for a decision making, but um, uh, yonghei, which is uh, courage, right, is needed mm -hmm. to stick with and endure with a decision, right? So you have to be able to make a decision and then you got to stick with your decision. So how did these two categories impact you growing up and as a writer now? You, you so, definitely need it, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I feel like, it's funny because I had neither of these things growing up. I didn't feel like I had a lot of choice because my parents would always be deciding things for me. Mm. And because I was always taught that I couldn't fail, I didn't have the courage to fail. Mm. So it would be things like, you know, if you fail a test, you were like, no, I actually, I didn't. I'll just hide it so my parents don't see it and we'll just you know pretend it never happened um but I feel like that wasn't great because then I would do a lot of things and once I started failing at those things I would easily give up things like piano um once I started going to theory could not do the theory and I was like nope not doing piano anymore did swimming couldn't do the diving nope did not do swimming anymore and it kind of carried forth until I found uh, badminton in high school which was interesting because most kids when they start badminton especially if they want to be competitive things like that they start when they're like five six seven I started when I was 17 so I was already like leagues behind uh, everyone else but they it kind of built in me a passion to keep going and have the courage to constantly fail but wanting to try again and I feel like that ended up carrying forth into my writing too mm -hmm. as like something that I knew I was going to fail a lot before I saw any success and even when I saw success in it I knew I was going to continue to fail but it was something I loved enough I think to have the courage and can and kind of determination to pursue um because I feel like kind of with badminton going in, I already knew I was going to fail. And with writing, I already knew that I was going to fail. But I knew that I wanted to keep trying until I was failing a little less. <laughs> mm. Failure, I think, is a great thing. It tells you that, like, like imagine if you were looking for some, some, um, some, some special medicine for your sickness. And um, imagine if it, you know, you couldn't, tell if that was going to fail obviously you could read about it and, and 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 with medicine because it gets studied and you get tests and things like that but if you um if you didn't have that and you had to check whether or not that worked and what a waste of time you're sick you need to get better you have to take certain things and if you didn't know those would the, these things would these set of things would fail for you and only these sets of things would work for you you'd waste a lot of time so failure helps you mm -hmm. actually speed up the process right and um mm -hmm. and so many people are afraid of failure they um like piano if you only failed earlier right then you wouldn't have had to get to the theory <laughs> part of it right like you could mm -hmm. i failed when i put my hands on the piano wow <laughs> right <laughs> you know so so um yeah that's um so so the courage because you still need um young hey to courage to continue what you're doing what gives you the courage mm -hmm. to continue um, waiting for for not twelve thousand but more? I mean, do you use money as your marker, or your, you know, or what do you use to measure? It it is interesting, I think, mm -hmm. because I do want to make it a career, so money definitely has to factor in. But I think when I first started writing, my goal was kind of only just to improve writing to be kind of like set in the same place as the writers I admired when I grew up kind of like the writers I learned in school um, like Kazuo Ishiguro, Toni Morrison, writers like that 
and I wanted my writing to kind of be taught in school. Um, and if money came, it would be kind of a bonus. But at the same time, it was kind of like optionless. <laughs> um, mm. Because I feel like whenever I gave myself a backup plan, that is when I would give up quickly. So when I went into writing, I gave myself courage to continue by not giving myself a backup plan and kind of just quitting my full time to go 100% into this, all the risk, all the consequences that might come with it. But I knew all the rewards that would also come with it if I had the courage to persist. That That is so true. That when we end game, when we set goals, that is actually, it becomes the um, the kryptonite that prevents us from going further. You've set the goal. You've achieved what you needed to achieve. Now you're goalless, right? So, so the one magnet that you had, if you, so in, in other words, if you set smaller goals, you now have more magnets that you attracts you mm -hmm. to that point, but also prevents you from going further. So how many things would you like, how many roadblocks would you have like to set for yourself by setting goals? Goals are roadblocks because mm -hmm. after getting through them and achieving your goal, it pulls you back to well, what should I do now, right? I've achieved. Um, and the mm -hmm. stronger the goal, um, the the more meaningful it is, the more it you needed it to pull you there is equally strong at pulling you and holding you back. So that's a, um, mm -hmm. end gaming is a, it, for great leadership and to truly get to a greater level of innovation. Um, how many people have invented, wanted to invent something and end up inventing something in their lifetime? If you say, no, I don't really care so much about it. I'm just going to let it flow, let it come through. Then you get to achieve at a greater level. Um, mm -hmm. This is this is very very intriguing. Um, so you you had to actually go and get an education. Um, uh, when I looked at you know your your educational background, I didn't. I'm not a writer, so I don't really know what um, a master's of science in creative writing means. Um, <laughs> you know uh, what, what? But but I don't. I know that it means something. Um, that you had to go through undergraduate and to get to that level. Um, so you had to stick with it for a long time. I and mean, we were looking at dates that when you set in foot at University of Toronto, uh, which is a, a kind of difficult place to get into, just so you know, people watching this will understand. And this was the year 2015 when you got in and you were in the Bachelor of Arts, the English language. Um, and uh, you know, you like you stuck with this continuously and then um i mean your your dad's a physicist uh, the pe helps and the restaurant owner helps but what was his response to you wanting to study english language or was that really already addressed when you were younger and he already saw the the the, the you know the shoots and you know the success and the potential well you no know, the the man in your life your dad first then then we'll talk about the other one <laughs> all right yeah so he absolutely hated it. Really? <laughs> he had an opinion. Yes. Okay, a strong one. Okay. Huh. Um, so it has always been his dream to have kind of his child be in STEM, you know, to be a doctor, lawyer, math, um, like accountant, that kind of thing. Um, the standard? But <laughs> yes, yeah. it, exactly. And yeah. it took... I suppose a lot of failing for him to realize that I was not a STEM person, <laughs> like not failing in a way that my grades failed, but failing in a way that like I mentally could not handle the way that STEM worked in the way that the test is functioned and things like that. Like it takes a long time for me to understand things. And when things aren't explained in detail, I start to lose interest and I don't understand. Anything. Mm. Like in math, I would always ask, my teacher why when they put equations on the board but no one would explain to me why they're like just use this equation it works like this and I was like nope there's no way I'm gonna end up understanding anything if they teach it to me like that um but with English at least in my high school they kind of really promote you to dig into the material to kind of understand the motives 
behind the characters, their lives, things like that. And it interested me far more. But my dad was like, that's not going to make you any money. <laughs> um, so he was not very supportive of it. So mm. I tried to look for a loophole in his logic. Mm. <laughs> so I told him I would become a teacher because he was a teacher and I can become a teacher with an English degree. Wow. And so that's how I convinced him to wow. let me do something I like while making it also seem like I'm doing something that he would want me to do. Mm. Very interesting. Has he come around now? Or does he think you're a teacher? <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, no, no. <laughs> he knows I've quit and I'm oh. going uh, with writing full time. I think it is like he has come around to see that write, in writing there is a future. But I think it is only after I had the Nebula nomination. And the Nebula Award is something mm. that is well known both in America, but also in China because they also have the Chinese version of it. Mm. And he was like, oh. You're being you're being recognized for something. Maybe maybe this does have a <laughs> future. You know, yeah. it is. Yeah, it's kind of like when you have those rankings or great markers for the mm. for him. This is kind of one of those markers, mm. um, if that makes sense. Oh, I, it totally makes sense. Um, I I enjoy speaking. You may have noticed that. So <laughs> you know, um, and and when I was in high school there were some performing art things where you had to like memorize volumes of, of, um, of spoken things so that when someone says something, you say something else back. So it's in the performing arts. And I thought that this was really interesting because it balanced the other side of what my parents wanted, my, especially my dad, he wanted me to be number one. He just, you just need to be number one. And I said, yeah, but the other number one is top 10%. So Right. And then that gives you freedom to go and explore other things. And I had the same question you had, which is why are these equations being written the same the, in the, those ways? I believe many people have that. So when I coach others to uh, to understand my invention, I'm selling them something that doesn't exist. So I have to be a really, really good speaker and I have to be very, very convincing, not through like convincing them with some Jedi mind trick or something, but to fundamentally see that if what we're doing is only taking things that we invent in the 21st century for use in the 20th century, that's not a good thing. Why don't we take something in the 21st century and invent a solution for the 22nd or 23rd century? That, you know, there are no competitors over there. See, as an author, you have to compete either with future authors or you have to compete with past authors. Same thing as an inventor. If you if you just do things that are build a better mousetrap, why don't you go work on like you know something that doesn't require that, right? There are no mousetraps. It's mm -hmm. something that fundamentally has no solution. The world needs a solution, um, but to stay in that mindset. And to get people to appreciate Bob Dylan, you know, he's a he's a he's a writer of songs, but he could have sang covers, and then we wouldn't know who Bob Dylan is, not the Bob Dylan we know in this world now. So you mm -hmm. have broken out and and done that. What, what so now you have your spouse, right? The other person in your life. When were you married? So about a year and a half ago, but we've been together for five. And what does he do? So he's an architect. So a different type of builder of worlds. Ah, ah yeah. Yeah. And uh, did he fall in love with your writing? Is that how it worked? <laughs> no. So we met through badminton, actually. <laughs> no writing involved. Wow. Badminton. So I did notice that by 2017, you were coaching people in badminton. How early did you start badminton? So I was 17, 17, right? Yeah. yeah. So that was 10 years 2013 ish. Ago. Yeah. Yeah. So in four years, you became a badminton coach. I was very vapid, I guess, <laughs> in my yeah. determination. 
when I, I mean, was right because if you look at it you became like people who start at like four you know four five six years old and they're working their way up and you start at 17 and in like four years by the time you're 20 you might you know that's what you wrote on your linkedin but you could actually be you might be like already quite impressive within two years i mean were you impressive just like very very quickly it was just like like what did you experience exactly in there so like i said my dad wanted to me to go into stem grade 11 and 12 were very important years for mm. um like schooling mm. so when i went to my dad did not let me go to like train and things like that for more than once a week so in the beginning i would do things like oh take one private a week next week forget everything do it again <laughs> um wow. but then because i was very determined i would do things like go to the summer camp in the summer every single day and spend my summer camps there and then because the summer camp ran from something like 8 a.m to 5 p.m i would go but then i would ask my parents to let me stay there um, until 10 p.m. and go home, do it all over again, like six days a week. And I would kind of build up from there um, and kind of look for any free opportunities to get extra training without having my parents pay for it because I knew they didn't want to pay for it until much later on when they saw how passionate I was in it, then they were willing to pay a little more for it. And because my coach saw how passionate I was in it. They were willing to give me additional like training sessions without cost. You have to be an incredibly fast learner or something that, you know, talking about failure and the things that, you know, as indicators and the things that indicate that you're not failing, this is a major indicator. I mean, look at the things you got from that. You got a spouse, you got, uh, <laughs> you got free lessons, uh, you know, you, you, <laughs> And you stuck out and then you started being able to make money being a coach. Right. So that's a um, that's an mm -hmm. indicator of how something could be uh, possible. Um, now, my next question is that, um, you know, it, what are some challenges you faced or had to give up in order to pursue this path? I don't I mean, obviously, you didn't have to give up STEM because it just you didn't want to be <laughs> that anyway. So so what what did you have to give up to stick with this? Anything? um stability <laughs> i would say because yeah. giving you a full up a full-time job you're giving up the stability of a second income to kind of supplement uh the household income so budget will be a little tight um so basically when i went into writing i had plans to kind of accelerate kind of like the way i did with badminton as fast as I could to take any learning opportunities, uh, mostly free if I could, paid if I could afford it kind of thing. Um, but I would also say you, like I would have to give up some of the artistry to my writing. I am a very experimental writer. I like to experiment with different things, but a lot of big publishers who are willing to pay you very big money to publish you do not like taking risks. They do not like very experimental work or stuff that pushes boundaries. Some do, uh, very few. Um, but this kind of touches on how you were talking about uh, why make inventions like for this century when they're gonna kind of not be important in the next century and you kind of got to think ahead. And for writers, I feel like there are a lot of them who do that, but then during their generation or their time as a writer, they don't become popular because they're either too far ahead, you know, and they are not acknowledged yet until much later when people are like, oh, actually, they mm. did this very cool thing that's like way above the time and people only are picking it up now. So it's kind of like, I have to sacrifice that experimentation, but not so much so that like I get rid of it all because I do want to be ahead. I don't want to follow the trends, um, which a lot of people are doing. Romanticy is on the rise. So a lot of people are writing romanticy, but I don't want to do that. It's kind of like when people are like, don't chase the trend. You got to be the trend um, mm -hmm. type of thing. But you do have to give up part of it or make your work more accessible to the audience. So you can try to find that balance of like being of your time, but also being past your time. 
Right. So you want to be uh, cutting the edge, not just on the cutting edge, right? So at the same yeah. time, you know, being recognized. Invention is, so we're, we have very similar um, experiences on that. Stability, as an inventor, I don't really care too much for stability because stability also means, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, being, um, you know, unnoticed. It's just not going, you're not going to have any upside, right? So you'll have, you'll be capped. This is how much you will make. And then we can actually do an actuarial calculation. That's how, that's how equations are formed. They're, the equation for a quadratic has been known. Cubic is also known. Quartic to the fourth power is unknown. How did you even figure out the quadratic? You had to do a PhD on it. You know, someone did. And then you mm -hmm. now memorize the recipe. That's the formula. The formula is a recipe. Do this. Why do you do this? I don't know. We just do this. Do it. Right? So, so that's what you're change. You, what you change in your life is you don't have a formula. I don't even know what's going to happen to you, nor do you, in five years from now, right? So mm -hmm. you know it's something related to where it is and how you can, how you can continue to reach other souls out there who like your work. How can you make? How can you create the work that they're supposed to be reading? And what is that exactly? So having the time mm -hmm. to experience that is important. So now I ask you, if the lights went out and you needed to completely reboot and restart your life and you were not allowed to go back to what you are doing, what would you be doing instead? I So before I became a writer, mm. one of the various dreams that my parents had shot down was becoming an artist. And I feel like I would still be some, doing something art-related. So before I wanted to be a visual artist and I think mm. that is uh, what I would do people around me like to say that I have a habit of choosing hard paths <laughs> and I feel like those are often the most rewarding even if they are the ones with the highest risks um, so yeah I think I would go back to being a visual artist maybe eventually it would lead back to writing anyways like graphic novels things like that but does this some of this come from your mom, um, who you mentioned had the art? Mm -hmm. I think so. So it's funny because my sister definitely inherited all the STEM from my dad. And then I inherited all the art from my mom. Uh, my sister is a chemical engineer, very different field from what I'm doing now. Mm. Um, yes, but I think it does come from my mom, but it also comes from like personal interests. I just like things that are very flexible and very free and kind of very creative, if that makes sense. Mm. So what does your mom think about everything? You ever sit down and ask her? Yeah. So like growing up, she was always the one who was like very supportive of everything I wanted to do, like whether it was piano, things like that. If I wanted to try it, she would just sign me up for it. Um, but then she kind of like my dad would always worry about stability, right? Because when they came to Canada, that's what they wanted. They wanted to be able to have like lay down a very concrete path for me to success so I can put a roof over my uh, my head, food in my mouth, things like that. And they just couldn't see that in anything art related, particularly like in China, unless you're a teacher, if you're doing something very like art related, it's very hard to make it a career unless, you know, mm. you're the author of Three Body Problem or something like that. Which is amazing. I mean, the other loophole is that your dad married your mom and your mom is an artist. So obviously dad, you chose um, you didn't marry a STEM person, <laughs> right? You didn't marry <laughs> another physicist. So why is that? And so the thing know. is, they are both teachers yeah. and they met at the same school. And Changle is a very small place. So you have a very limited pool of people you interact with and you can choose from, especially when it comes to kind of social classes too. Like your friends are generally around like the same social class, same um type of work related things unless you're relatives and things like that so that's basically how they met if you ask the question at the end point right which is my final question for you but um but if you ask the question at the end of your life what did you do with it 
you know, with all this time and, and the end of life is not when you reach like a hundred or something. It's when your efficiency runs out. All right. So it could be 70 for some people. It could be 50 for others. Efficiency, meaning like, let's, let's say you traveled the world and you had to fly it constantly. When your body says to you, you can't fly anymore. What did you do with your life? And if your answer is, oh, I added stability. I put food on the table. All right. You know, mm -hmm. what did you do with your life? right? Anybody could have done something like that with their life, but what did you do? What did you want to do with your life? You only live once. So mm -hmm. that really gets people thinking, right? You found a way to put a roof over your head. You married someone who can help, right? You know, obviously you didn't marry someone, that, but you also married someone who appreciates what you do, something about you. Mm -hmm. you, you in, the, in your case, you mentioned badminton, but then what does he think about your writing? I think similar to my parents. At first, he mm -hmm. also thought it should be more like a hobby, right? It's like not sustainable, not uh, mm -hmm. stable. But now he is a lot more supportive of me and like one of my biggest supporters, um, which mm -hmm. is nice, I think. Because right. I, I think about this question a lot. It's kind of like what I want to um do with my life and I think when I'm talking to a lot of my family members like especially when they were younger they didn't have a choice in that kind of thing right they did not have a choice to kind of think past uh, working every day and putting food on the table they would come like immigrate to let their kids have a better future but then they would end up working 20 30 still now years in factories or like you know manual labor jobs um, just because they cannot do anything else or do not want to do anything else that kind of would, you know, unbalance that stability that they've built up over time. Um, and I feel like I, because I have the privilege to kind of pursue something that is more risky, I want to take it uh, while I can. You know, I don't want to more just exciting, have... Right? I mean, that too. With, I mean, yeah. you have... This is who you want to be talking with at a dinner party, right? <laughs> right. You know, someone who just doesn't like Indiana Jones, Lara Croft. That's exciting. You know, you, you go, <laughs> let's say someone's digging for dinosaur bones. Like who's paying for this? Somebody is because they want to know if there's dinosaurs in Sahara. What kind of dinosaurs? Mm -hmm. right? Oh, wow. These dinosaurs used to breathe under the ocean. Oh, there was water here. Who pays for this? How can this possibly make money? It is in the most impossible illogical path that is the lotto ticket <laughs> not the money right not the money but the mm -hmm. lotto ticket of ultimate change right calculus came mm -hmm. from a you know a monk who didn't have anything to do um and uh, also this monk was going to die at 49 right so francisco cavalieri all his food was paid for all the things and he could focus on mathematics um I don't know. I can't interview him, but you know, this was, he's the father of, he was even before Isaac Newton. So when you think about who you are, what we need to do is buy you time, buy you time. Like if I were, if my daughters were around and I had nothing to do, but to spend time with them, I would want them to entertain me and I would want to entertain mm -hmm. them and we would want to have conversations. But if I was distracted and I had a lot of burdens I would say, be quiet, right? But that's the mm -hmm. actual opposite of what I want them to do, right? I want I want interaction. Why would you want someone sitting there just to be quiet all the time? I want you to be able mm -hmm. to speak and enjoy what you're doing. This is who you are. And what you have managed to do, it's very difficult to change people. People can't even change themselves, but an environment can change them. So you've created and you are creating an environment that allows them to see what the possibilities are and you're the you're the only one that like, we don't have no idea what could happen to you in five years this interview could be extremely valuable mm. right you know <laughs> so much value because we don't know fingers crossed right right yeah fingers crossed right but we know mm -hmm. that there is something happening to you uh, because otherwise those uh judges were all wrong nebula judges and all they must have been <laughs> all wrong about you right that's impossible when you have others start, you start seeing what you're doing. So and I, my last question is, if you had a time machine, please tell us, tell the world about 
your version of the time like what would this machine do right where would it bring mm -hmm. you if it is the traditional time machine but i leave it open to you what do you what would you do with it so a lot of my friends when they talk about oh i want to turn back time to fix that time i blocked out from drinking or things like mistakes they've made in their life but i feel like my motto especially after writing has become to never regret the things i have done or the things that have happened to me whether they are good or bad because they kind of make me who i am also i feel like it would make me far less content of a person if i had a time machine i constantly want and constantly wanted to go back and fix things um about my life. But I also think that I am a person who kind of has the privilege to think this way compared to some people who might not be as fortunate, you know, maybe they want to turn back the time to start closer to the finish line. I mean, or like closer to the starting line, because some people in life start much farther than others, and some already start a couple yeah. hundred um, meters ahead. Um, but I feel like if I had a time machine, it would be one not to go back into like the past or go into the future to see how I would turn out. But one that would pause time so I can catch up on all the books I need to finish reading. And so I can really slow down and enjoy and kind of reflect on each moment of my life instead of letting it pass by so quick. Because I feel like that is what COVID kind of did for me. It is terrible of course, a period of time, but it was also a period of time, I think, that allowed people to really sit down with themselves and think about what they are doing with their life, if they're happy with it, um, mm. and kind of like, yeah, reflect on what is it they want to do once, um, if, you know, the pandemic is over and things like that. And I feel like a lot of people ended up making big changes, career changes, personal changes uh, mm -hmm. during COVID because they finally had time to just not rush day to day uh, without thinking about what is happening and kind of just going through the motions. You've created that time machine for yourself already. <laughs> Little that you know, right? You've, you've changed everything that you interact every day because, you know, the flip side of looking at the six or 12,000 is that it's so small that it doesn't matter. You really don't need to go to work because it it that's yeah. not your that is not the right that is not the goal. That is not the end goal isn't to make twelve thousand. The end goal isn't to make six thousand, nor is the end goal to make fifty thousand as a ghostwriter. The end goal isn't related to the money. The end goal is to is is, is there's no end goal. You have got to keep exploring to see the possibilities, right? So slowing a time machine that slows things down, that allows you to be on a different frequency where time no longer affects you, right? Every day, every mm -hmm. moment, you're, you're there to think and to keep thinking about uh, practicing more thinking, right? So, so I, you know, to, to, to put a term to it, I call it being a true explorer as opposed to LinkedIn, which is, um, which is many people put their things up there so that someone could exploit them. Hey, hire me. Mm -hmm. Take away my time. The best hours, by the way, are for you. And so to pay me mm -hmm. whatever you'd like relative to what you think. And um, and then you get you get paid. Some 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 form of trust that's in a in a in a number form. And then you use that mm -hmm. to go and buy things so that you could feel good about what you just sold away but you'll never get what you sold away back. Mm -hmm. You can't get back from five years ago, yesterday even, or even this hour ago that when we started, we had no idea what, I didn't know what your answers would be, right? <laughs> Out of respect for the uh, interview, I, you know, if they ask, if people ask, I give them the questions. But, um, but the, the ability to be an explorer takes practice. There are very few people who mm -hmm. are explorers. Jack Ma, Alibaba. Uh, his mom wanted him to work at the Apple factory and to be in charge of 5,000 people. That would be an incredible end game. 5,000 people. My mahjong could be very stable now. I could know what my where my son works. But compared to what he ended up doing, 
he also did this teaching thing, right? So, you know, um, yeah, the, the, you know, the, 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 the difference, the Delta between being a leader of 5,000 versus someone who forms Alibaba and the founder, it's, it, you know, in monetary terms, in his case, it's measurable. But there are so many things that are, you know, not, not imaginable or even measurable because we don't know what we're measuring. And I'll leave you, uh, you know, people who listen to this with, um, with uh, something that's highly measured, which is nutrition. You measure the nutrition, who measures the nutrition most, which is hospitals. And hospital food is highly measured. But you don't, you and I don't go there and say, hey, Ajahn, for your birthday, would you like to, me to take you to the hospital and we'll have dinner there, right? <laughs> You know, so, mm -hmm. so we know that measuring the nutrition isn't all of that. Same thing with measuring money or measuring based on someone hiring you and saying, I will own all of your time. Once you do that, you should always do what iJunk's doing, which is to take some of your time, even if you're exhausted, you've sold all those times to continue to explore. And I think that during COVID, many people started thinking, I need to explore for myself. I need to explore beyond what someone assigns as my value and what else am I good at, despite being distracted on your day job. And that everybody can do what Ai-chan is doing, which is to be an, a better explorer. You can be better at exploring. It takes practice. It takes looking at individuals who have completely sent their, their whole life around exploration to say that, hey, I could do a little bit of that. And I, I think that what you have done is a great story um, in its infancy still, but it nevertheless, it is, it is an indicator that it can be done. Um, and I certainly hope um, for, you know, and I feel that you will become very famous because you are spending time on your exploratory journey. You become known because in order to do that, you have to practice exploration. And who knows what you come, may come up with, but buying yourself time, a time machine that slows down time so that you can come up with the ideas and then have the courage to hold on to them as opposed to throw them into the garbage can. Right. So um, this is really wonderful. Thank you for sharing your story. And I look forward to seeing what happens to you. And well, we'll stay in touch, but I, I I know that something incredible will be happening to you. That's my other one. Though. Hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. Um, thank you. No, thank you for this incredible conversation and your question. All right. So with your permission, I'm going to share this in uh in under my uh my my topic of raising your awareness. Um and uh as we wrap up. I just let you know that I am an American born Chinese. I don't read or write any Chinese. Um, my Cantonese has improved in these past 20 years because I started broadcasting out some time ago. They're, they're, they're probably chasing mm -hmm. me now, but I wanted to wrap this up because it's so, so important. Um, if I never did that, my daughters wouldn't know uh, the Cantonese. If I didn't do this during COVID, I wouldn't have the different radio shows. Um, I don't do it for money. I do it to create an environment. Environments change people because they're allowed to look at the environment. So um, I, I have met another friend in the world uh, who is also an explorer. And anytime you need any help exploring um, or staying on course to explore, just reach out. We'll definitely do. <laughs> All right. We're going to end here before they call me the third time. Okay. Oh no. Yeah. Sorry for taking so much of oh, your time. Oh no, no, this is wonderful. This is this is so important. This is more important than taking that call. All right. Be well. All Take right. care. You too. Have a great Bye. rest of your day. You too. Bye, Ajahn. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.